We are drawing to a close what has been a, a, a lengthy and, I hope, transforming study in this book of Acts. Uh, the end of Acts um, basically centers around uh, three lengthy narratives, three th things that happen in Acts at the end, uh, the last eight chapters or so. We're covering it quickly, partially because the, the stories are somewhat long, and there's these, these lengthy narratives. First, it centers on Paul's arrest in Jerusalem, and then Paul's trial, which was quite lengthy and had repeated uh, seasons of this lengthy trial that he undergoes, and then finally his journey uh, to Rome as a prisoner. The end of the book of Acts basically centers around those three main events. So we're covering the second of them this morning, uh, the trial of the Apostle Paul. Uh, if, you're, if you're new with us, just to explain why we do this, our, our basic conviction as a church is that the best thing we can do on Sunday morning is to look at a passage of Scripture and to study it together. Uh, we, we don't really have any interest in hearing uh, what I have to say, uh, because who cares what I have to say? Uh, what matters is what the Lord has said, and knowing it and examining it together. Now, we, we also kind of vary our study from short passages that we can look at in depth, and longer sections that we can look at uh, to see the, the overall scope of it. Part of the reason we, we don't only preach one verse at a time uh, which would not be necessarily bad to do, but we don't preach one verse at a time, is so that over time our church can be exposed to large sections of Scripture. I've, I've often thought uh, humorously of, of showing up in heaven and having a large number of biblical authors coming to me and saying, listen, you, you preached, God willing, preached for, for 30 years, and you never even once told them what I had to say in my book that I wrote. I thought, you know, I, I guess I, it would be good if, if Malachi isn't coming up on Sunday uh, or, uh, in heaven and saying, man, gosh, 40 years of preaching, not once did you ever, you know, so, so part of my goal here is that we move somewhat quickly through sections of Scripture so that we can get a flavor of them, understand their main themes, their topics, and so that you can certainly study more of the details uh, on your own, but it's also so we can move to other sections of Scripture as well and give an understanding of them also. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to cover this trial. The trial extends over three chapters. Uh, what that means is we're not going to look at great detail at any one part. We're trying to understand what is the overall point of the trial of Paul for the church today? What, what's the overall point? And, and then in applying that point, what are some key themes that we can apply in our daily life as Christians? So the, the first half of this message, I'm just going to spend, we're going to spend with our faces buried in the passage. We're just going to sort of walk through it, all comment here and there. We won't read every single verse. And then the second half of the message will focus on applying the main point. So what I, what I want to encourage all of us to do as we walk through it is to ask ourselves the question, why is this in the Bible? Why is this story of the trial of Paul in the Bible? What was Luke hoping to get done in the hearts of the Christians who read about this trial? What is God's intention for transforming lives as we read this passage? And, and hopefully, we'll reach basically the same conclusion together, and then we can apply that uh, into our lives. It's worth remembering that in perhaps A.D. 57 or 58, the Christian evangelist and leader that we know as the Apostle Paul wrote the following words, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. He wrote those words, and then he was arrested in Jerusalem, transported to Caesarea, and is now facing trial. He now has the chance to prove what he believes, to prove what he says everywhere in his letters, that for him to live is Christ. All that he is about is testifying to the Lord Jesus. So let's, let's bury our faces, if we can, into these chapters. We'll read and comment as we go, and then we'll apply. Okay, so look down there. Chapter 24 in the book of Acts. Let's begin reading. 
After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation in every way, and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. Quick comment, that is likely not the case. Uh, Felix was not known for his moral governance. This is probably flattery in an attempt to gain his hearing. But to detain you no further, Tertullus continues, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. We want to notice right off the bat that these accusers are organized, they are united, they are skilled, and they are unscrupulous. They are willing to lie about Paul to say whatever they need to say in order to get him condemned. All the way back to the trial of Jesus, we know that the Jews were limited in their ability to govern themselves. They could not enforce legally uh, capital punishment. They couldn't kill Paul, and they had to submit ultimately to the Roman authority over their land. So they are appealing that their perspective of Paul would be reinforced by this Roman governor. Let's keep reading verse 10. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, you gotta love, you gotta love Paul is not interested in flattery, he just states the fact. You've been a judge. Over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem, and they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, and having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation. Should they have anything against me? Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing, that I cried out while standing there among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. We see here a strategy of Paul that he's used elsewhere. He, he's attempting to make clear the real cause of the controversy. He defends himself legally. He says, look, th th there is no legal basis for me being here. I, I, I'm not a rioter. I didn't even do anything culturally offensive. According to the customs of the Jews, I purified myself in going into the temple. I, I, I'm doing nothing illegal of what they are talking about, but I will confess that I am speaking about the right way to fulfill the Old Testament scriptures. So he's attempting to put in front of this governor, look, th this is essentially a religious disagreement. There is no legal basis for me being in this courtroom, but there is a dispute going on about what is the right way to follow the God of the Old Testament. And he's essentially saying, in proclaiming Jesus... I am proclaiming the right fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's putting himself forward as a teacher of the right way to follow God. And the hope, I think, is that Felix will understand that this is a religious dispute. This has nothing to do with Roman law. Paul hasn't done anything illegal. But as we find out later, Paul always hopes in introducing his gospel teaching to use the context as a moment for witnessing as well. 
However, in spite of Paul's innocence and his defense, he is returned to prison. Look at verse 22. Felix, having a, a rather accurate knowledge of the way, so he knew about Christianity, put them off, saying, when Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. Commentators speculate but because this man was likely not a particularly moral individual, uh, listening to the Apostle Paul preach about self-control and God's coming judgment probably alarmed him. He did not want to hear about this. At the same time, he hoped, in verse 26, that money would be given him by Paul. So he's hoping for a bribe. So he's alarmed by Paul's teaching, but he's heard that Paul is able to gather this offering, so he obviously has some access to money, and he's hoping, maybe if I keep him in prison long enough, I'll get a bribe. That's what Paul is facing. That's the kind of justice he is being placed under. Now, notice verse 27. Very, very important that we not skip this verse. When two years had elapsed. Two years, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So Paul is put in custody under this unjust governor who's hoping for a bribe who will not ultimately respond to Paul's witness, but is catering and caving to the pressure of these Jewish leaders. And so he keeps Paul for two years incarcerated in Caesarea. Now we want to feel, we've been through Acts, we need to feel the effect of this. Paul, the traveling mission. Have we seen Paul stay put anywhere unless he was literally trying to found a church? And once he had that church founded, he's always on the move. About the longest we see him is in Ephesus, where he's, he's preaching for a couple of years to found that church. The rest of Acts, we see him moving here and there and, and back to serve the churches. What must this have been like for Paul to be stuck in this jail cell with no certainty of release for two years under unjust charges? What was that like for Paul? Now, this moves us to the second scene of this trial. There's basically three scenes, three different rulers, first under Felix, then under this new governor, Festus, and then Festus welcomes King Agrippa to evaluate Paul. So let's, let's keep looking. Notice, notice what it says. After three days, Festus had arrived in the province, and he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests, they haven't lost any zeal over two years, and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So he said, let the men of authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let him bring charges against him. Then you notice down there in verse 8, Paul defends himself, arguing in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense, but Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor. Again, you notice the pressure the Jews are exerting. How difficult for Paul. Said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourselves know very well. If I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charge against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. We notice in this second stage that Festus unwillingly, or unknowingly, I guess, uh, protects Paul from yet another assassination attempt. They want to get Paul to Jerusalem so they can kill him (laughs) on the way or once he gets there because they have more power in that city. That's what their hope is. So unknowingly, just based on his travel plans, uh, Festus protects Paul, but then he's, he's hoping to ingratiate himself to the Jews in this new ruling position. And so he says, "Uh, Paul, would you be willing to be tried in Jerusalem? And this creates this legal dilemma because Paul declares as a Roman citizen, he had the right to do this. I appeal to Caesar. 
A, a, a prisoner could do this. A, a citizen like Paul was could say, I appeal to Caesar. I have the right for Caesar himself to judge my case. So you could sort of self-appeal in Roman law. And so he attempts to do this. I, I appeal over your head to Caesar. And Festus essentially says, well, you've now tied my hands, Paul. You've tied my hands. You've appealed to Caesar. And that's where you're going to go. So for the rest of this trial, you find Festus in this legal dilemma where he has to send Paul to Caesar, but he has to have something to write about him because for two years, this man has been incarcerated and is now being sent on a trial, but there's literally nothing that can be written against him. You want to notice in Paul's earlier defense, he, he makes the biblical case for witnesses. The reason he talks about the Asian Jews is that they were the ones who actually grabbed Paul. Uh, the, the point is, in the Bible, eyewitness, direct testimony is what is required. Hearsay is irrelevant. In, in, in Roman justice, in biblical justice, hearsay is irrelevant. Eyewitness testimony, personal testimony, is what is needed. You must personally accuse what you have personally witnessed. Well, Festus has a problem now because nobody has personally witnessed anything. And so he doesn't want to send Paul the prisoner to the Caesar saying, I have nothing to say about this guy, but if you could please evaluate this case. Because Festus obviously at that point would seem like a fool. So Paul, ironically, in his innocence and in his appeal, is kept in prison. But under the surface, it means that Paul will get to Rome, which is where he wanted to be all along. Let's keep looking, see what happens. This moves then to the third stage of this trial. He's still incarcerated. Festus doesn't know what to write about him. But then Agrippa, who is a Jewish, at least partially Jewish, king, arrives and Festus wants his counsel. So Festus is the Roman ruler. King Agrippa is this Jewish ruling representative. You, you might know his father was the one that died in Acts uh, 12. His grandfather, King Herod, was the one that sent soldiers to kill the infants in Bethlehem when he heard about Jesus. This is King Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, the son of King Herod who died in the middle of this book. Here he is. He arrives. He's a Jewish ruler, and Festus wants his opinion. Let's look down there and see what, they, what, what it says. This, this leads to a, a, a basically an introduction by Festus, which I won't read. He's explaining the background of the case, and he invites Agrippa to hear about this man. Agrippa says in verse 22, I would like to hear the man myself. And Festus says, tomorrow you will hear him. So in verse 23, on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in and, King Fest and Festus says, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. This makes it explicit. What the Jewish leaders want is Paul's death. They want him dead. This is not a slap on the wrist. This is not a misdemeanor. They want him executed. This is a capital trial. But, Festus says, I have found that he had done nothing deserving death. We, we've mentioned this over the last couple of weeks. You want to notice in Paul's life the repetition of Jesus' final days. And in Jesus' final days, there's two primary themes People want him dead, but he's innocent. People want him dead, but they can't find any charges against him. So Paul is quite literally walking in the footsteps of his Savior. People want him dead, but he's innocent. Festus can't find anything criminal to say against this man. So then Agrippa says to Paul in 26 verse 1, you have permission to speak for himself. And let's read this magnificent defense from Paul as he uses this moment to preach the gospel. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. My manner of life from my youth 
spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. Again, I am fulfilling the hope of our fathers. This is not some new idea. I am simply representing God, Paul is saying. Look down there, verse 9. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogues. And I tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Once again, we have this reminder that Paul, before he was the church planter, was the church hunter. He was the hunter of the church. And this now will prove to be a basis for his defense. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. And at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me." Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, but in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles." Paul is determined, he is determined to represent the gospel as coming from the God of the Old Testament in keeping with the prophets. He is not innovating a new religion. He is fulfilling God's historic plan. And notice that his focus here in this courtroom, surrounded by power and royalty, is on Jesus Christ. He is determined to represent the Lord Jesus with courage and fearlessness, declaring this is my calling. And you can see the validity of it because I was not an insider. This isn't some insider's malicious sect. No, no. I was an outsider. I was opposed. The only way I could become a representative of Jesus is if I had met Jesus Christ himself. So my personal set testimony reveals, says Paul, the truth of what I am saying. I was not an insider. I was not one of the original disciples. Actually, quite the contrary. I was opposed to everything that Jesus stood for until now. He is my life, and I stand for him. Incredible moment, the drama of this. You have the, the royalty, the tribunes, Roman guards. You have Festus, King Agrippa, Bernice, the grandson of Herod the Great, who sent soldiers to slaughter the infants in Bethlehem, is sitting here listening to Paul, the church hunter, declare to him, Jesus Christ is God, and he is the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes. He is the Savior of sinners, and I am sent to declare to you and everyone else that can hear my voice, that Jesus Christ is the only hope of salvation. What a moment in that courtroom. What a moment that must have been. 
Listen to this, verse 24. You, you, you get the sense that this was an anointed moment. They, they want a defense. Paul gives them a preaching message. Verse 24, as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus interrupts him. He says in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Precisely what Paul says what happened when the gospel is preached. The gospel is foolishness to the Gentiles. It's foolishness. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. I'm speaking true and rational words. The king knows that I about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for it has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in such a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Paul said, whether short or long, would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am except for these chains. <laughs> Paul sees a mob. He sees a congregation. He sees a courtroom. He sees a, a message moment. He sees his judge. He sees a potential convert. Paul's view of life is Christ-centered. It is christ dominated. Everything about him is shaped by how can Christ be glorified in this moment? He could care less what Agrippa does to him ultimately, what the final decision is that he's been in prison for two years. He says, well, this apparently is why I was in prison for two years in the economy of God. I'm fulfilling Jesus' promise that my, his followers will stand before kings and rulers and those with all authority. And I will proclaim to you, Agrippa, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And yeah, absolutely, I hope you believe. I absolutely hope you're converted right here, right now. Then the king rose, and the governor with Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. They're basically saying, look, look, this is clearly, he's, he's a religious messenger. He's not a criminal. So once again, Paul's innocence is proclaimed, and yet... He could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So in spite of his innocence, Festus is going to lean on Paul's appeal and basically say, we, we have to follow through now. We have to send him to Caesar. And so we get the sense that Paul was being carried along under God's sovereign hand and providence. He's done nothing wrong, but he's been in prison for two years. They have nothing against him, but the king won't let him go. He makes this appeal to protect himself from death, but now that appeal will keep him in this place where he'll be sent finally to Rome. Ultimately, you get the sense God has Paul right where he wants him. If he doesn't defend himself, he'll be assassinated. He does defend himself, and that means he has to be sent to Rome. But ultimately, that's where God wanted him to be in Rome. So Paul is just carried along. What, what, what do we think now as we reach the end of this trial scene, all three trials, what do, what do we think is the main point? How would you describe, what do you think the effect of these chapters is on the church? Thinking about Paul proclaiming the gospel to the powers of the land, and now ultimately you get the sense, look, if he's going to go to Caesar, we have no doubt he's going to say the same thing to Caesar. There's no greater power in the world than Caesar. He's saying it to Caesar's representative. What's the point, do we think, for the church? What impact does this have on the church? I think it's this one. We must be prepared to stand for Jesus Christ if we are put on trial for his name. I think that's the, the message, ultimately, that lands on the churches in Ephesus and Corinth and ultimately Rome. When they hear this story, they read this and they think, yeah, the legal persecution of the church, what must it result in? It must result in the church standing for Christ. We must stand for Christ even in the face of legal persecution. Pa Paul sort of represents the gospel. He represents the church in spite of the power of those around him, in spite of the injustice of their charges, in spite of the weakness of being captured in this prison for two years, in spite of the, the ridiculous foolishness of this trial. He is not distracted by any of those things. He simply views it as his opportunity to stand for his Lord. Now, I think the churches that read this, and ultimately we are supposed to receive this message. We must 
stand for Christ, even in the face of legal persecution and trial. We must stand for him. That's your job. Be like Paul. Stand for Christ. Paul is presented as the kind of prototypical, non-divine representative of the gospel. Obviously, not all of us are called to travel the world, but all of us are called to stand up for Christ even in the face of legal persecution, of personal discomfort, of, of foolish and unrighteous accusation. We're to stand up for Christ and stand in him boldly and courageously. I, I think the trial of Paul, ultimately, what point does it make? There is a victory, even in apparent defeat, when the church stands for Christ. There is a victory even in apparent defeat when the church stands for Christ. You would think that Paul is being defeated. He's captured. He's in prison. He's caught up in this, this legal rigmarole and these unjust rulers who can't get out of each other's way. And yet, apparently, ultimately, Paul has this glorious moment of standing for Christ. The church must stand for Christ even in the face of legal persecution and difficulty. And in that way, they also will have victory even in the face of apparent defeat. Now, how do we apply this to our lives? Three applications. How are we to stand for Christ if we are put on trial for his name? If we are put on trial for the name of Christ, what can we learn from Paul about how he stood for Christ, both before his trial, during, and the result of it? How are we to, to stand for Christ? What is the effect that this passage of Scripture is to have on your life this week? What does it matter that we just read this passage and examined its meaning? What does it matter for you? What does it matter for me? How should it shape our thinking? How do we stand for Christ? What are the contours of that stand? Well, three of them, I think. First, we stand with integrity. We stand with integrity. It is not without reason that again and again and again, Paul is said here to be innocent of any criminal charge. And it is to the great benefit of the gospel, you notice in the passage, that they can't find anything against Paul legally. Now, they still have a lot against him, but ultimately, the only thing that's, that's at a highest level offensive about him is his preaching of Christ. And, and I think the church should take a lesson from that. That should be the ambition of the church, that the only thing the culture has against us is our standing for Jesus. So that there is something of a value in the integrity of the church. Paul's integrity as a man of of civil obedience when he's under just laws is, is a, a sort of an adornment of the gospel. It is a good thing when the church, uh, when it's under just reasonable laws, not immoral laws, I'm talking about reasonable laws, can, can stand up and say that there is nothing criminal in my lifestyle because that then frees them to keep the focus on the thing that is going to be offensive, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you notice that Paul's integrity is what helps him during the trial. He also has integrity within the trial. He's not going to succumb to this temptation to bribery that, that Felix presents to him. And that's helpful for us to know, too, because even in little trials, our temptation is to sacrifice our integrity to get the easier way out. Even in little trials, we'll just sacrifice a little bit of integrity for the greater good. Just, just a little bit of integrity for the greater good. And yet Paul here will, will not. He will stay in prison because he will not bribe this man to let him out. The integrity is necessary. It, it also, we're going to notice this caveat, integrity of the church does not protect the church from accusation. I, I think it's common in our culture today to assume that if, if there's a loud enough accusation, some part of it might be true. But we want to learn from the scriptures. Not always the case. Paul is innocent and yet accused. He's innocent and, let, and yet left in prison. He, he's innocent and yet there's this vehement opposition. 
So we don't want to define integrity as that person who has never been accused, because that would eliminate Paul and Jesus. We want to define integrity as what a person actually has done before God. What a person actually has done before God is their integrity. Not what people say about them, what they've actually done before God. Integrity is valuable, but it is not a promise where there will be a lack of accusation against a man of God or a Christian. We need to stand with integrity while also remembering that will not protect us from false accusations. You need to stand with integrity. There is no Christian who is perfect in this world. But if we are vigilant in little failures of conscience, we will guard against those more scandalous things which would bring a great reproach on our Savior and weaken our witness. It is a dangerous thing to give little concessions to weakening our conscience. And that is something every Christian can apply because every Christian represents the name of Jesus Christ. Think about little concessions of conscience. Little moments of not paying for something that you get at a store. Little moments of, well, just giving yourself the benefit of the doubt in your tax forms little moments of maybe not honoring your responsibilities at work or in civil society, little moments of sacrificing integrity before God. Look, our integrity is meant to adorn our witness to the gospel. It served Paul greatly in this trial that there was nothing they could find against him. That should be our ambition as well. Stand with integrity. Second, stand with patience. Stand with patience. I, I, I zeroed in on, on the length of time because we could get caught up in the, the trials and the one after another after another. But I think part of the point of this passage, the reason it's repeated three different scenes and the reference to two years, it is to bring to the, to the uh, kind of awareness of the church, look, sometimes God uses surprising seasons of waiting rather than seasons of apparent movement. And, and most Christians I know tend to struggle with those seasons of waiting. It's hard for them. Imagine what it was like for Paul, sitting in a jail cell. You could kind of find him maybe debating with the Lord. Lord, is, how can this be the best use of my time? Surely it would be better. I could have the church. Have you seen what I've done over the last? We could have the church in Rome planted. I could be in Spain by now. Planting churches and preaching in the synagogues and raising up pastors. Think about all the stuff I could be getting done. And yet Paul is called to stand in a season of waiting, in a season of patience. I think the church needs to, to hear this lesson for us as well. Sometimes God's wisdom works the most swiftly through calling us to wait. Through trial after trial after trial. In God's economy, God was using Paul exactly the way he wanted him. We can apply this to our own lives. Think, think of ways that you feel confined. Maybe, maybe there's, there's a, a physical weakness. God has confined you in a certain way. And, and you can think, this is clearly not the best way for me to serve God. Or, or maybe there's a relational situation where you feel limited. You feel confined, restrained in your ability to serve God freely. And you could think, this isn't the best way for, for me to be used right now, God. Because you're having to deal with relational issues in some level, and it takes time, and, and you've got to deal with that rather than doing some kind of, uh, you know, uh, other thing you'd rather be doing with your time. Physical weaknesses, relational difficulties. We, we might think of financial limitations that, that are pressed upon us. Oh, Lord, if, if, only, if only I didn't have these limitations. Think, think how I could bless my family. Think how, what I could do for the kingdom. Oh, gosh, there's, there's limitations. And yet, we, we want to learn something. Paul himself, in God's economy, is best serving God sitting in a jail cell. God's ways are not our ways. 
God's ability is beyond our understanding to fathom. Our assumption is that if I'm moving, I'm serving God best. And yet there is throughout the scripture this idea that sometimes God lays his church low in order to use them the way he wants to use them. Sometimes the greatest witness to the Lord is his servants' faithfulness and confidence and hope in a season where they don't seem to be getting anything done. Brothers and sisters, let's, let's be aware of that when we're in a season of, of clear waiting. Psalm 27 is a, a verse, at the end of the chapter is a verse that I've, I've just used about my own heart over and over and over when I'm, I'm facing an obstacle that I, I don't feel, I feel like I would be able to serve God more if I didn't have to deal with this. Psalm 27 at the end says, wait on the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage and wait on the Lord. I imagine Paul had to quote that psalm or others like it to himself. Wait on the Lord. Felix wants you to come in again and and talk to him about Jesus. Wait on the Lord. Felix is out of office, um, but I'm sorry to tell you, he's going to leave you in prison Wait on the Lord. Uh, Festus uh, wants to try you in Caesarea. He's going to set up a whole new, a whole new trial. Uh, the, the, the Jewish priests are going to come down and accuse you again. You're going to have to be ready to defend yourself. Wait on the Lord. Festus wants to know if he can send you back to Jerusalem. Um, uh, you, what, what do you want to do about that? I appeal to Caesar. Well, now Festus thinks you're innocent, but you've appealed to Caesar, so eventually you're going to have to go to Caesar now. Wait on the Lord. Oh, new trial. Uh, Festus wants to include Agrippa. He really wants to hear what you have to say, and so we're going to parade everybody. We'd like you to, to preach to them, and, and, and uh, you know, would you be willing to do that? Great, great. I finally get to witness. I'm going to preach. Yes, here's the reason. Here's what I believe. Yeah, we think you're innocent, but we're going to keep you in prison and send you to Rome. Wait on the Lord. I'd submit that when we stand with patience, we are witnessing to the faithfulness of our God and the sufficiency of his gospel, that it's not limited to our movement. Don't assume you can serve God best by moving all the time. Sometimes you serve God best by waiting, peacefully trusting in him. I'm not saying self-imposed waiting. I'm talking about times when God clearly has put a limitation, a confinement in your life. And that the temptation is to rail against him. This is not the best use of my time, God. Wait on the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage and wait on the Lord. Finally, we stand with the gospel. You cannot read this trial without being amazed at Paul's determination to talk about Jesus. Yes, he defends himself legally, but what does he want to get to? He wants to talk about Jesus. He wants to represent him. He wants to explain that this is the gospel from God, the God of the Old Testament. It is about Christ and his suffering for sinners. It is the gospel of grace that can rescue a church hunter and turn him into a church planter. And it is the gospel for anyone because he looks at this courtroom and he says, there might be converts here. Paul's speeches again and again and again. It's the gospel from God, about Christ, of grace, and for anyone. Don't you see that in Paul's messages? It's from God. This isn't a new idea. It's about Christ, Jesus the Lord, who died for sinners. All of you, he died for sinners. He rescued people like me. It's of grace. He turned me away from my, my sinful, rebellious path, and he turned me on to a path of serving him. And guess what? There is no distinction. It is for anyone, even you, King Agrippa, and even the, the lowliest uh, court servant here, and, and, and you, Bernice, and, and everyone here, anyone can claim the name of Jesus Christ, can have their sins forgiven, and can be ransomed from their life going towards God's judgment and turned on the path of going towards God's eternal life. 
is the gospel for anyone? What does Paul stand for? He stands for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's what our church must do. That's what our church must do. It must stand for the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's why we sing it. That's why we preach it. That's why we talk about it in small groups. Look, look, may there never be a Sunday at this church where we're not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. May there never be a community group meeting where at some point or another, the, the people in that group aren't talking to each other about the gospel of Jesus Christ. May, may there never be a relationship with an unbeliever where our view that there is only one hope in heaven or on earth for salvation is not represented. May, may there never be a relationship that just goes on without that being represented. May, may there never be a song set that we sing that doesn't talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look, we must not assume the gospel. We must proclaim the gospel to ourselves and to each other. That's what Paul does. He's not distracted by his trial. He's not distracted by his waiting. He doesn't assume there's a more efficient way for him to serve God than to talk about the gospel. Brothers and sisters, clearly, the church is called to see Paul as their representative in this passage. Unique in his suffering, but not unique in the claim of Jesus upon him. And we must stand for Christ with courage when we face seasons of trial, legal persecution, seasons of waiting, the temptation to escape suffering or to stand for something else rather than Christ in that moment. Those of you who are in the workplace, your integrity is meant to adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those of you who are at home serving children, your message must be Christ and him crucified. Those of you who are building relationships with neighbors, you must at some point bring to them the good news that Jesus is the Savior for sinners. All of us must see this gospel-shaped, gospel-adorning life as our calling, whether we're doing spreadsheets on Wednesday morning or changing diapers on Friday night or reaching out to our neighbor at the Thursday afternoon barbecue. We, we need to let the gospel shape our thinking and our conversation and our fellowship until, like Paul, in our own little sphere, in our own little way, we can say, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We must stand for Christ with courage in the face of legal persecution, in the face of difficult seasons of waiting, in the face of unjust surroundings, accusers and governmental officials who have no interest in the well-being of the church and only in the interest of their own political betterment. No, we must stand for Christ. Don't be caught up in the, the cynical machinations of this world and this society. Be caught up in the glories of Jesus Christ so that everywhere we are, the thought is his reputation, his glory, his value, representing him faithfully. That, that is our calling. What does the trial of Paul do for us? Part of what it does is it takes away the worst case scenario. Doesn't it? It demystifies this worst case scenario. What if, what if gosh, what if I was in prison? Or what, what if I couldn't, couldn't travel? What if I couldn't see people? What, 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 if, what if everything about my life was taken away? What if? It's already written in the scriptures. We can stand for Christ in that moment. Redemptional Church, let us stand for Christ with courage in the little moments so that we can stand for Christ in the big moments. Let's do it with patience. Let's do it with faith. Let's do it focused on the gospel. Let's pray.